Is there a risk of paralysis with uh, spine surgery? Um, is it permanent? Is it reversible? How often does it happen? What type of operations causes it? Is it different with each type of operation? I'm Anthony Kosh, the lead neurosurgeon of the Spine MDT. I'm going to answer these questions in this video. The reason I'm doing this video is that I've had quite a few inquiries about this recently from patients. There's a lot online about this subject when people or patients type in the name of their operations and also on discussion forums and on social media. Overall, the risk is very, very low, but I'm going to go into some of the details of the different operations, what causes those risks what can be, and what can be done about it. Let's very quickly go over the anatomy of the spine, uh, the spinal cord and the nerves, just so we can get an understanding of where those risks lie with the different types of operations. So um, the spine is a stack of bones starting from your pelvis, going all the way up to the skull. It's divided up into the cervical spine, which is the neck region, the thoracic spine, which is the bit that's encased and surrounded by your rib cage, and then the lumbar spine, of which there are uh, five bones. These stack of bones are made up of cylindrical blocks of bones stacked on top of each other with an arch of bone um, attached to the back. And if you stack them on top of each other with those arches, you form a tunnel down the middle, a canal, which contains and protects the spinal cord. This is a cross section here, that's the spinal cord there that runs up and down. Um, which is the main chunk of nervous tissue sending messages to and from from between the body and the brain. Now the spinal cord runs down the neck and thoracic part of the spine and then finishes at around the first and second uh, vertebral bodies of the lumbar spine. And then from that point onwards, it's just the nerves that come off the spinal cord that um, predominantly innervate the muscles um, and supply sensation to the skin of the lower limbs, your legs. So let's start off with uh, the lumbar spine. It's a more common area that gets operated on. Um, so in this lumbar region of the spine, there's no spinal cord, but there are all of the individual nerves. Um, so damaging, and, and then there's also each nerve that exits that you're trying to um, decompress. So it's the risk of damaging just one nerve, the one that you're trying to decompress, versus all of the individual nerves that run down the middle of the spinal canal. Um, the British Association of Spine Surgeons has got some booklets on this. They quote about one in a hundred cases of damaging um, a single nerve. If it's revision surgery going back in, that risk does go up. Um, a bit higher. So what's damaging a single nerve, for example, the L5 nerve, the L4-5 level is quite common, or L5-S1, these are usually the nerves that go sort of to the calf and shin area and therefore control movement of the foot. So you can get, you know, weakness in the lower, in the lower leg. Um, and that risk of one in a hundred varies from, you know, being completely, completely paralyzed, paralyzed ankle to a a weak ankle, um, but also um, also it being transient as well to completely permanent. So there's a range within that, and it's a very minority, an absolute minority of, of patients that end up with an absolute permanent, complete paralysis of that uh, lower limb. So of that one percent, a very very tiny tiny percentage. Um, in the British Association of Spine Surgeons Leaf, it doesn't actually give a quote or a number for damaging all of these nerves and therefore causing complete paralysis of both lower limbs, uh, incontinence and impotence because of the nerves that go to your bladder and bowel. And that's because it's extremely rare. Somewhere else in the literature quotes, other quotes are in the region of one in 10,000. So it's extremely rare to damage all of these nerves and end up with a permanent uh, weakness of the lower, lower limbs. One of the things that can cause it though is usually post-operatively post any bleeding in this facility you just get blood building up and compressing this bundle of nerves that goes down to your legs. Um, and that usually happens within the first few hours to the first couple of days after surgery where patients start to notice severe pain worsening and then the lower limbs start going in quickly. The surgeon should suspect this, um, scan you if appropriate, or sometimes take you straight back to theatre to try and evacuate or remove that blood clot and find uh, the bleeding point. That's very, very rare. 
usually if if if, if the repeat surgery is carried out fairly quickly like within within the first couple of days then um, you can you can usually expect to recover some if not all of that function but that can take some time and that does vary from patient to patient but again this is all very rare and that applies for most lumbar surgery whether it's removal of a disc uh, decompressing the spinal cord for stenosis operating in that vicinity uh, so overall it's very very rare and the reason being because you don't have spinal cord tissue there to cause complete paralysis you do actually have to damage all of those nerves which is actually quite difficult to do but as I said if there's a hematoma there blood clot building up compressing them over time it can cause that as long as you get in early and evacuate it and most patients they do actually recover a lot if not all of uh, their function now higher up in the spine things are a little different here we have this structure here called the spinal cord so this is an MRI scan um, of the cervical spine, the neck part of the spine. And you can see the silhouette here, it's quite a detailed picture. You can see the skin of the front of the chest, the front of the neck here. You can make out the silhouette of the, the chin, the lips, the nose, back of the head, back of the neck here. So this here is the bottom of the brain within the skull. And across this line here where my mouse cursor is, is the opening at the bottom of the skull where the brain stem emerges and forms at the spinal cord which is housed within this bony spine here. So that's the spinal cord running down and a bit of disc tissue here uh, compressing it. So operations to this part of the spine do carry a little more risk because the spinal cord itself is quite sensitive. Remember, it's only um, in under a couple, a couple of centimeters of diameter. So it's very sensitive to damage. Any damage to the spinal cord itself will cause problems in the arms and legs, including complete paralysis so going in through the front of the spine or the back of the spine can give you damage to again an individual nerve leaving at this level and give you a weakness of that level and it's in the same order in the lumbar spine of about one in a hundred um, or less and again within that one in a hundred within that one percent there's still a variation of permanent weakness of say the arm um, versus a transient weakness and again, a big variation between complete weakness or paralysis of the arm versus uh, a mild weakness, which uh, can can recover. So there's a big range within that 1%. So that risk is very, very rare. Um, complete paralysis or damage to the spinal cord and causing therefore injury of anything that this part of the cord covers, so arms and legs, it, is rare but a, a recent review of all of the literature um, doesn't really put it as complete paralysis but exacerbation of myelopathy that means worsening of um, pre-existing weakness in the arm and leg of anything from 0 0.2 uh, to 3.3 percent when you do a review of all of the literature now there are a few reasons um, to why that happens to the spinal cord um, here we have a, a, a view of, the, of an illustration of the operation coming in from the front of the spine where we remove this piece of disc here that's compressing the spinal cord uh, to decompress it. Sometimes the process of doing this itself um, can cause what we call this kind of rebound edema or bruising of the spinal cord. Um, and some of that sometimes that can be permanent but sometimes that bruising settles down the swelling inside starts to improve but often there's still some permanent loss of function although it's improved a bit you end up with some permanent loss of function again it's very rare it's within that order of magnitude i explained um, from that previous study of uh, 0.2 to you know 3.3 percent probably on the, the lower end of that um, direct damage to the cord as well from the instruments or, or sometimes damage to any blood vessels that supply blood and oxygen to the spinal cord can cause that, which makes it a bit more uh, permanent. Now, sometimes um, the decompression itself might be inadequate, so you haven't taken quite enough of the material that's compressing the spinal cord. And because it's just been operated around, things can get a little swollen and the surgeon has to go back in and remove a, bit, a little bit more. Um, again, a lot of patients still tend to do okay with that. They still tend to make some recovery, but it takes a bit of time. And then the other factor is post-operatively, in, in the region of removing that disc, you can get, or, or even if you come in from the back, 
just like in the lumbar spine you can get some bleeding in that vicinity and that build up of blood clot around the spinal cord puts pressure on it compresses it and patients wake up or start to develop progressive weakness of the arms and legs in that scenario the the surgeon should recognize it the staff looking after you should recognize it um, and then you can you should go back in straight away evacuate that blood clot and in, and if you can do it in a in in a good time frame um, some patients a good number of patients can expect some recovery uh, of that and that time frame again of recovery varies and lastly the other thing i want to very briefly go over is um metal work in the spine operations that require screws and fusion there's a small risk of um the screw being mis uh, misplaced or malpositioned as we call it so here we have a cross section of the spine this is the front the back knobbly bit of bone you can feel at the back and this is the spinal canal in the middle and what holds the arch what forms the arch of bone at the back of these two structures here called the pedicles and that's where we place uh, screws in the spine Nowadays, we use techniques such as navigation or even with x-ray guidance, you can get the, the screw placed fairly accurately into that bone, but very rarely there is a risk of the screw coming across here, going into the canal. Now, in the lumbar region, if, if that needs to be done in the lumbar region, the chances of that causing paralysis or damage to the nerves is extremely low. It's very, very low, way less than uh, one percent and the, you know the, the amount of times you have to revise the screws is is very very low in the cervical spine higher up where you have the spinal cord the trajectory of the screws you place is usually an outward manner so it does more rather than going towards inwards it's just a different type of screw system uh, that's used there is a risk of that damaging an individual nerve rather than the spinal cord but in very rare circumstances it can happen uh, damaging the individual nerve again it's in the region of one percent or less and the requirement for revision is actually very very low so yes with spinal surgery of course there is a risk of paralysis or injury to nerves because that's the area we're working around but it's very very low that risk is very very low um, it's always mentioned when uh, obtaining consent from a patient because that's informed consent you need to know the risks um, before having a procedure done, you need to understand the benefits and the risks so that you can make an informed decision. But it's always the first thing that pops into everyone's mind. It's all over the internet. Um, overall, that risk is extremely low, but it is there, yes. So I hope you found this video helpful and I hope I didn't frighten you too much. The purpose of it was actually to try and put your mind at ease and explain how low these risks are. Um, if you found it helpful, please like the channel and click subscribe. That really helps people living with back and spine problems find this channel where I try and give useful information uh, to help them. There's a whole series of videos that are specifically related to the different types of operations on the spine. So I go um, into each operation in a bit more detail explaining the benefits and risks and how it's done there. If I can help in any way, you can either leave a message down in the comments, I do try and answer them, but it's probably best to contact us directly through um, the website or email us and call us. Be very happy to help you. Thank you very much for watching.